Welcome to Wounded for War, featuring the Bible teaching of Phil Santo. This broadcast is an online video teaching through the Bible to help people rethink Jesus and his mission, to seek out the hurt, the lost, and the broken. So grab your favorite drink and a seat and join us as we start today's talk. Welcome back, guys, to Wounded for War. This week, we are going to be diving right back into 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 18 through chapter 4, verses 2, or verse 2. Uh, and we're going to be talking about how to glorify God by pursuing real wisdom and um, having the right perspective on leaders. So I need you to bear with me a little bit today, though, because I'm wearing my break a leg shirt in uh in honor of the fact that yesterday I ended up in the ER uh, with a, uh, a rolled, um, sprained, really bad ankle. So, um, a lot of pain and only 24 hours ago and it's still there. So, bear with me a bit, but we're going to do this today and uh, cover a very uh, great subject. And, uh, and it starts in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Let's just dive right in. And let's see what Paul has to say about glorifying God in pursuing real wisdom. He says, let no one deceive himself. It's a pretty good place to start. Um, I think that if you think about it, how many times do we deceive ourselves? We don't really uh, mean to, but it just so happens that we think we have the right knowledge. And yet someone shed some light and all of a sudden we feel embarrassment or, or like we need to correct our, our thinking. And maybe we've been thinking this way for a long time. And now we have to change directions. And he's just saying, hey, don't let anyone guide you down the wrong path. Don't let even a leader or uh, a friend, someone well-trusted, you, you got to check everything for yourself. You can't just trust um, that people are, have your best interest because they may have the best interest and the wrong information. So let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he's wise in this age. Now, Paul's in this moment poking at them a little bit. He's got a sarcastic uh, bit of nature in him in this moment. And why do we know that? Because Paul knows that the Corinthians have a high value on philosophy, that they're well known for the pursuit of worldly wisdom. And we've talked about it in the past that uh, these people uh, were the epicenter for philosophy. They were the epicenter for uh, oratory and teaching and, and you have all the new ideas in life. You bring it there. That's the place that you go. I mean, we, we now have, <laughs> hate to say it, but Facebook and all these social media platforms where we bring our thoughts for the day, right? And we share them with everybody and, and hope that it, it seems wise to people. Well, <clears throat> Paul says that these people uh, should not deceive themselves and that they ought to, to realize if anyone thinks themselves to be wise in this age, he says, let them become a fool so that he can become wise. Now, I know. Immediately, we go back to that thought where people say, well, you know, to be a Christian, you got to be mindless or you got to be an idiot or uh, it's just a crutch. They don't equate it oftentimes, or people don't equate Christianity with wisdom. They actually think of it as foolish, and we'll see that that's uh, God's um, looking at, at the, the whole situation in a light that kind of mirrors and matches what, they're, what we all think, in, in a sense. But he flips the script, and so he says, let him become a fool so that, he, so that they can become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolish with God. Since it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the reasonings of the wise are futile. So he knows that he's made the system and he stacked the deck on his side. Essentially what this uh, says is that you really, if you think that you're wise, you've actually reached a plateau of learning. You're unteachable at that point. Nobody can get through to you anymore. You think you got it all. Have, have you ever met that person? I know that person. One, I fight that person within myself. I don't know about you, but I struggle when I think I know something and I just got to get it out and, and I got to be right. And that's, that's something where um, 
God would say, if you're that person, if you're arrogant in your belief, even if you could be right, you could be a fool just because of the way that you're approaching it. The Lord knows that the reasonings, the way that people think, the rationale that we use, that um, that, that is uh, of, of the people that call themselves wise, it's futile. Why? Because God has built the system in a way that he always wins. And, and we don't really, uh, you know, always see that in life, how it plays out. But you see, there's a reckoning, a day coming where he makes all rights, all wrongs right. And he, and he changes, uh, those that got hurt, um, and, and suffered for his namesake end up, uh, being first. He says the last will be first and the first will be last. And he's going to reconcile these things. And, and those that, um, were caught in the craftiness of the, of the wise of this world, God's going to change that dynamic someday. He also says in Proverbs 3, it says it like this, Proverbs 3, 7, it says, Be not wise in your own eyes, but reverence the Lord and depart from evil. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't be your biggest fan. Don't think you're the end-all be-all. And then he says, reverence the Lord and depart from evil. That reverence the Lord, that's going to come into play in a moment. And then in Proverbs 11, 2, he says, He that <clears throat> is void of wisdom despises his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his peace. About Proverbs 16, 16, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather than to pursue silver? Wisdom is better than riches. You could spend your riches and, and or something cat catastrophic happens and you could lose all that. But wisdom, wisdom is something that never leaves you. You see, you can gift a man a million dollars and he could waste it and never be able to gain that money back. But someone who's wise, they know how the process works. They understand how to get that million dollars back or regain it, right? Wisdom is something that's not fleeting. It's not something that someone can take from you. Or how about Psalm 111, 10? It says, the reverence of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the very starting place. The psalmist writes that, that's, that, that literally to reverence God to look at him in the right light and to say, you are God and I am not. The psalmist says that that's the very starting point of wisdom. You see, even the most brilliant philosophers of the past understand that those um, that realize along the journey that, that, that uh, they don't know everything, those are the wisest people. Simply put, we have to stay teachable in all areas of life. Let's take a look at a philosophy uh, article that was written. Uh, it was from Philosophy Today. It was in uh, 2018. And the article simply, <clears throat> I'm going to read it. It's going to be a lot of uh, information, but I, I want you to, to stay with me. And the reason why is because this article was written from the, uh, a philosopher um, standpoint, and, and it's all about what is wisdom. It says, <clears throat> it's the philosophy and uh, psychology of wisdom that they're going to go through, okay? So, every time I utter the word wisdom, someone giggles or sneers. Wisdom, more so than ever, uh, expertise does not sit comfortably in a democratic and anti-elitist so uh, society. In an age dominated by science and technology, it is too loose, too grand, or too mysterious a concept. With our heads and our smartphones and tablets, in our bills and in our bank statements, we simply don't have time or the mental space for it. But things were not always this way. The word wisdom features 222 times in the Old Testament, which includes all the so-called wisdom books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Songs of Solomon. 
The word philosophy literally means the love of wisdom. And wisdom is the overarching aim of philosophy. The symbol of wisdom, maybe you know, is the owl, a bird of prey. Indeed, wisdom derives from the protocol Indo-European root, weed. Because I live in Washington, that's W-E-I-D. <laughs> okay? Um, to see. The word means to see. And is related to a great number of words, including evidence, um, advice, guidance, history, idea, idol, view, or vision. In Norse uh, mythology, the god Odin gouged out one of his eyes and offered it to Mimur in exchange for a drink from the well of knowledge and wisdom, symbolically trading one mode of perception for another, a higher one. But what exactly is wisdom? You see, the name of our very species, Homo sapien, <laughs> signifies wise man. So what is it? People often speak of knowledge and as wisdom, as though they might be closely related or even the same thing. So one's hypothesis is that wisdom is knowledge or a great deal of knowledge. If wisdom was, if wisdom was knowledge, then it has to be a certain kind of knowledge or else learning the phone book or names of the rivers of the world might be counted as wisdom. And if wisdom is a certain kind of knowledge, then it's not scientific or technical knowledge, or else contemporary people would be wiser than even the wisest of ancient philosophers. Any 21st century school grad would be wiser than Socrates. So that can't be it. But the Bible tells us, when pride comes, then comes disgrace or a fall. But with humility comes wisdom. Socrates was the wisest of all people not because he knew everything or anything, but because he knew what he did not know. Or, more subtly, because he knew the limits of the little that he did know. In fact, the world really came together in the 5th century BC with both Confucius and Buddha echoing from afar the same words as Socrates. Now pay attention for a second here. I just told you that the Bible says that, that as we reverence God, as we realize our place in this universe, that, that, that's the beginning place of wisdom. And here's what the people of the world, the best thinkers in the world have said. The only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing, Socrates. Real knowledge is to know the extent of one's ignorance, Confucius. A fool who recognizes his own ignorance is thereby, in fact, a wise man, Buddha. But it's no doubt Shakespeare who put it best. The fool doth think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. So, here's what's funny. Even the greatest philosophers, even the most worldly people, when they come through all the studying that they can, and they're the specialists in this field, they come to the same conclusion, and that's you got to remain teachable. you got to become uh, a person who is open, and most importantly, to the things of God. You know, if you don't know everything, and nobody here on this planet knows everything, somebody must. And hence why God um, is important. We start right when we approach anything and everything with humility, especially God. You know, Psalm 14 says it this way. It says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. You know, it, it seems natural that if there is no God and I'm an atheist, well, then I must be the highest point of intellect. But see, the highest point of intellect in our world, these men came to the conclusion that they weren't. When we look, at, uh, look to God for wisdom, he'll lead us to his word and to community. And why? Because 
others can help make things clear. It's called understanding, right? Said in a wis uh, wisdom is found in a multitude of counsel. But it is him at the end of the day, it's God working through people and through his word. So we don't elevate people. They're just tools in God's hand. Um, I want to share a story with you about that. You see, there was a time when I was in the School of Ministry for pastoral training, and they had us serving for a certain amount of hours per week. And I wasn't usher material. I wasn't uh, exactly the guy you stick up in front doing, uh, you know, um, handing out brochures or anything of that nature. I ended up in prison ministry <laughs> and also um, in a homeless uh, encampment where we would bring a bunch of people into a little coffee shop and do a Bible study. Well, there was this gal uh, named Norma, and uh, she was a very uh, brand new at the whole um, thoughts of who God is and what he's about. And, and what's interesting is oftentimes God will reveal himself to new people or to, to unbelievers in a way that it's supernatural. And so, uh, in her case, one day I noticed she wasn't at the meeting. So, um, I and another person went to her, her home and, um, she was very ill. That's all she said. She came to the door and she said, I'm extremely ill. I cannot, um, come tonight. And so I prayed for her, I laid hands on her and I prayed for her. And, um, the next week she came running into that meeting. I mean, literally running in. And she just said, you healed me. You healed me. Immediately when you left, I felt 100% well. And I was so flipping out about it that I went to the doctor to see, you know. And, and so she experienced something that was from God through me, but from God. And when she came in, I was taken off guard because she was kind of... Uh, not just saying you healed me, but she was trying to elevate me in front of a bunch of people. And thankfully, um, I was new in ministry. There was a guy that was there with me, Leif Jacobson, love the guy. Uh, and he just, he, he stopped Norma. He says, hold on, Norma. We need to praise God and thank him because though he used Phil, it was a gift from God. And, uh, and I've learned that along the way that we just don't, there's no need to elevate people. Why? Because at the end of the day, a leader is only a person that God is using. And so in this case in particular, he says, and he goes on uh, and he says in verse 21, he says, so let no one boast in human leaders for everything is yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. Everything is yours. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. What's Paul saying? He's saying, you guys in Corinth are elevating, you know, oh, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. They're elevating these human leaders, and they're saying, man, Paul's saying, you guys don't get it. Those leaders are nothing different than you. You see, every one of us, when we're brought into the kingdom of God, we're made heirs. Paul is the heir Cephas, Apollos, their heirs, they're, they're adopted into the family, just like you. And so Paul's saying, why are you elevating people when it's God that elevates and puts people in their positions? You know, Paul would say it over and over and over in different uh, books that by the will of God, he made me an apostle. Not by my work and my wisdom and my strength and my pushing up the corporate ladder. No, by the will of God. Paul would say it this way uh, as well. He said in Ephesians, he says, uh, I, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now, with grace of God, not law, you can have peace. And here's the best part. Why should you be at peace? 
if you're now in the family of God? What is it that, that brings peace? It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, you and I, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Currently, if you are in Christ, you have everything you already would have in heaven. Theoretically, he has said, I've already made your, uh, your assurance of being my kid up in heaven a solid thing. Sent my Holy Spirit to be dwelling in you so that you had a deposit to show that I was coming back for you. And that everything that is yours in heaven is yours now. Your authority. He even kind of gives some, some clarity on this. He says, everything spiritual in the heavenly places. But he, he, he also says, hey, what, what's everything that's yours? Well, you're Christ's and Christ is God's. So everything that is God's is yours through Christ. You've gained everything you need. You don't need, therefore, to elevate people. That's why we worship Jesus and not leaders. Because Jesus made the way for you and I to have these spiritual blessings, to have these practical blessings, to have a position and a place where he provided for us to be a son or a daughter of the living king of kings. He's made a place for us. One day we'll end up in heaven. We'll be with him. And that's why he would go on and he'd say in, in, in verse 1 of chapter 4 and verse 2, he says, a person should think of us in this way as a servant. These great speakers, these great teachers, these great leaders. He's going, no, 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 no. Think of us as servants of Christ and managers of the mystery of God. In this regard, it is required that a manager be f found faithful. Now, notice the, there's one characteristic that Paul draws out in this place about a leader. There's one thing required, faithfulness. How many things do, do we require in our churches today? Man, if you don't have a, a master's in divinity, if you don't have this, if you don't have that, I mean, they want the perfect everything to put you on staff. You gotta go through a, an assessment to make sure that you're uh, gonna stick. Unfortunately, I think that's because a lot of what we're doing is man's way and not God's way. He says, I just need a faithful person, man. There's other areas where he'll say, not a, a newbie, and then some characteristics that show that they are faithful. One woman, man, a, um, there's, there's other classifications, but they, they really just expound on what faithfulness is. You know, I think we do a big disservice when we start going outside of God's plan and we start making our own plans for what leadership looks like. He's clear here. We need to follow people that look like Jesus because Jesus is worth following, not men. Paul said it, I think, best when he says, follow me as I follow Christ. He didn't say, follow me because I'm perfect like Christ. He follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, in the areas where I'm killing it with following the Lord, dude, follow me. But he also said, hey, I'm the chief of all sinners. The good that I would, I do not do that which I will not to do. I do it. He doesn't want you to follow him in those areas. That's why we can't follow leaders. I would be a really piss poor example of someone um, that you should elevate ever, <laughs> ever. God said that, that he chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You want to elevate a fool? He says, I'll choose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. You want to elevate the weak? No, we want to elevate Christ because he's done everything and given everything that we need for life and godliness. So, 
with that thought in hand. Where's your wisdom at today? Is it banking on the latest book you read? The greatest philosophy you've, you've watched, uh, maybe The Secret or you're watching Oprah or who knows what it is. Where do you find your wisdom? Might I suggest that you take a humble position with God and forget about the people that elevated themselves in your life. Forget about the, the leaders and the, and the so-called experts. Just you and God. These books of wisdom that are found in the Bible. If you want wisdom, if you want understanding, if you want uh, these blessings that God says are yours already, if you're just in Him, well, then I would say, posture yourself, posture yourself with humility and ask Jesus to come into your life and reveal Himself as wise. Ask Him to, uh, to help you to take a humble position. You say, Lord, I, I don't have the strength in me to be humble. Help me to be humble. Lord, I, I, I want to know that you're real. I want to know that you are the wise uh, plan for my life. That your wisdom is better than mine. Start there. And see if he doesn't enter in and show himself to be real, to be a caring father, to love you, to start to change you and give you wisdom. I can tell you, not a week goes by that uh, my wife doesn't say how much she loves me and appreciates my leadership. There was a day where that wasn't the case, but that is the case now. You know why? I can only point to one thing. The more I submit my heart to the Lord and let Him lead me because He's wiser than me or the experts, the more I do that, the more others benefit around me. She sees the benefit the most, and so she because she's affected by it, she's constantly reminding me how she thanks me for it. I want that for you. So as I close in prayer, that's what I'm going to pray for. And if you want prayer, definitely let me know. Hit me up, instant message me or, or comment. Um, don't forget to like uh, and, and subscribe so that you can actually get more of these uh, videos so that you can learn and grow as well. All I'm doing is teaching through this Bible so that you can gain more wisdom, so that I can grow in wisdom. So let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for your love. And I thank you for your truth. And I thank you for your wisdom. I thank you that you don't just let us uh, completely fall flat on our face and just leave us there and like anyone else would do is just kind of point the finger and laugh or do a, I told you so but instead Lord you you constantly wait there as a loving father with a, an opportunity and an open arms and just saying hey I know you've been foolish just like the prodigal child he was foolish he took his dad's wealth and ran off spent it on prostitutes parties and yet that story that reminds us of who you are Lord the father ran to the child and embraced him and loved him put a best ring on him a signet ring put her best robe around him killed the fatted calf for a party and said my son's returned Lord thank you that you await us and are coming back to you in that same fashion you don't have a rod that you want to smack us with, but you open your arms and you give us your best. I thank you for that. Whoever's listening, Lord, I pray that you would 
uh, draw them in by your wisdom, by your way, by your Holy Spirit. Let them experience the fruitfulness of a life with you, the blessings and the wisdom and the understanding that come along with it. I praise you for these people, and I pray, God, for my friends that will watch this, that, Lord, you would do a mighty work in their life and in our heart. I ask this in Jesus' name and by your authority, Lord. Amen. Read ahead for next week, and until then, I love you guys. See you later.